today's talk, what I want to show you is how spins behave when they propagate in graphene, and in particular, when uh, we artificially modified uh, the spin orbit coupling in graphene. Uh, so the work that I will present has been uh, carried out in the group of uh, Sergio Valenzuela here in Barcelona, and I want to give uh, special thanks to to the, to the experimental group. This is particularly, uh, I want to thank uh, the PhD student, Luis Antonio Benitez, the postdoc, William Saber Torre, Maris Costake, that is a senior researcher, and of course, uh, my mentor, Sergio. So I am uh, this guy here. And I would also like to thank uh, the theoretical support from the, uh, the in-home collaboration with the group of Professor Stefan Roch, and particularly to Jose Garcia. Um, <clears throat> okay, so it's useless to say that graphene is an extraordinary material from many point of views, but I want to like I will I, I would like to show you why uh, graphene is uh, relevant for spintronics. Okay, so. Beyond being uh, a gate tunable uh, material in which you can control by electrostatic gating what, uh, what is the nature of, of the carrier that you have in the system, it also has high electronic mobilities. And what is particularly re relevant for, for spintronics is that you can inject and detect spins in graphene. This was uh, experimentally demonstrated in this breakthrough experiment in the Van Base group in Groningen. And it's also an idea of spin channel. This is uh, due to the low spin orbit coupling of graphene and due to also the lack of hyperfin interaction. This, this means that if you have spins that propagate uh, or the spins that are injected in graphene, they can propagate snugly over very long distances, okay? So it was theoretically predict that spins can propagate with spin lifetimes in the range of microseconds to milliseconds, okay? And this is extremely huge if you compare to any other uh, materials. And what is particularly relevant also for, for graphene is that you, in principle, can manipulate the spins. And this is something that is unique of this platform. This, you cannot uh, you cannot done you cannot realize this in other, in any other uh, material proffer. So how you can um, realize this spin manipulation is via these uh, proximity induced effects. When you stack graphene with other two dimensional materials, and you can uh, engineer these vulnerable the structures in which by stacking different materials you can combine properties among them. So I will focus on the on, on today's talk on uh, on the um, so uh, bilayer heterostructures of graphene with high spin orbit coupling uh, transition metal dichalcagonides. So let me start by explaining what's what's happened when you bring together graphene with uh, a transition metal dichalcagonide. So the first thing that uh, occurs is that due to this breaking of the uh, of the pseudo spin uh, symmetry, you open this gap in the graphene band, st uh, band structure in the emitted electron bolt range while keeping this linear band structure. And the second consequence is that the combination of this spin orbit coupling bringing by this transition metal like alkalinite in graphene, together with the breaking of, of the uh, space inversion symmetry, you remove this spin degeneracy. So basically you have this spin splitting in the bands. So if you look how is the spin te texture of uh, the graphene band structure, you see that you have these uh, spins here close to the chestnutality point that are pointing out of plane in a sequence that alternates between the K and the K prime point, okay? So the first question is, okay, so if I have spins that are propagating along this uh, graphene channel, is there any influence of this spin texture that is imprinted by this uh, high spin orbit coupling material in graphene? So this is something that we tried to answer, and this is something that I, was, I will show you now. But before this, let me uh, let me briefly uh, explain you what are the sort the sort of uh, devices 
in which we measure these, these effects, okay? We work with these lateral uh, heterostructures or these lateral uh, structures. And basically the, the devices consist on a graphene spin channel in which we attach different uh, electrodes. Uh, we, in this case, we use two ferromagnetic electrodes that we use as a spin injector and a spin detector and these outer metallic electrodes. And we use this um, no local uh, configuration uh, that was introduced this morning by, uh, uh, by Professor Van Barves. And basically what it consists on injecting through these two guys, a current. So when this current is injected through this ferromagnet, we create a spin accumulation underneath this contact. And this is a non-equilibrium process. So these spins that are accumulated here start to diffuse along this spin channel and are detected by this second ferromagnet. So you can also apply the magnetic field along the easy axis of this ferromagnet. And this is the typical non-local spin signal that we measure. So you have these big jumps, meaning that you have a switching of, this, uh, of, the, of, the, of one of these guys, okay? So this is what we call in the community spin signal. But there is a second key experiment because so this is an indication that we measure something here, but I mean, you can have some artifacts, but there is one key experiment that this spin precession experiments in which we apply the magnetic field out of plane. So if we have a spins that are diffusing here in this spin channel, they will start to possess due to this uh, magnetic field and the signal that we pick up in this ferromagnetic detector is something like this. So it has this sort of oscillatory behavior, okay? And so I want to show you because of the relevance of this experiment, the seminal work that was done in uh, Van Weiss group in Groningen, in which, so this you see here, um, uh, an, uh, an image of the lateral device. So you have a graphene flake in which they attach several ferromagnetic electrodes. And by performing this no local uh, measurement, they first demonstrate that they have this change, these sharp changes in the spin signal when they apply the magnetic field along the easy axis of these ferromagnets. And also this key experiment in which they apply the magnetic field out of plane and they saw this beautiful uh, Halle curves from where you can extract all the spin dependent parameters like the spin diffusion length and the spin lifetime of the, of the system. Now, the idea is how we can uh, get insights uh, of this proximity induced spin orbit coupling and on this spin texture that I explained to you before. So what we perform or what we try to measure is, is, is the spin lifetime anisotropy. So what is the spin lifetime anisotropy? This is the difference between the spin lifetimes when the spins are possessing in plane or when they, they are out of plane. So depending on how, is this, how these spins process, you will measure this ratio and this will give you an indication of uh, anisotropic behavior, okay? So as I explained before, if you apply the magnetic field out of plane and the spins are injected in plane, they will start to process in the in graphene plane, but you can apply other configurations like magnetic field along the spin channel. And in this case, the spins will process out of plane and you will have information about the out of plane uh, spin diffusion length, or you can apply the magnetic field with an angle with respect to this easy ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetic easy, uh, easy axis. And you can also extract, uh, uh, as I will explain to you later, also this uh, both component, the in-plane and the out-of-plane spin lifetimes. So before going to the, to the results, let me show you this as, this is the basically the block equation and these are the numerical solution to this equation when we apply the magnetic field at one specific oblique angle okay 40 degrees respect to the AC axis and out of plane uh, to the with the AC axis of the ferromagnet and what you see is this oscillatory Halley curve but in this case we have some remanent 
spin signal here, okay? So this Riemannian spin signal here means that comes from the projection of the spins along the magnetic field direction. And you will see here in the presentation that I will plot this uh, anisotropy in this, in this, using this, this um, cosinus square. And this is basically because when you analyze what is the spin component that is parallel to the magnetic field, you have to do twice this projection. So one is from the ferromagnetic injector to the magnetic field direction, and then we back to the uh, ferromagnetic detector. So that's why we will plot, you will see that I plot here the data as a function of the cosinus square. And just keep in mind that in the case that you have an isotropic system, so it means that you have the same spin lifetime when the spins um, um, persist in plane or out of plane, you will measure something that is this is straight line. Why, if you have some anisotropy in the system, you will you will see that you have a deviation from this straight line. And if this is an isotropy is larger than one, you will see this sort of deviation. While if the the this uh, anisotropy is, is is lower than one, you will see this sort of deviation. Okay. So this is a typical optical, this is an optical image of a typical devices that we fabricate here in Barcelona. So you will see that in most of the devices we have, so you see here, this, um, this is a graphene flake in which we attach several uh, ferromagnetic electrodes and metallic electrodes. And you, you, you see here that we partially cover the graphene channel with this tungsten disulfide uh, flake. But we have also this pristine graphene channel, if you want, that we use as a control sample to see how the spin, uh, the spin dynamic change uh, between gra uh, pristine graphene and uh, graphene in proximity with this transition metal like carbonate. And now in these devices, we implement this technique of oblique speed precession in which we apply the magnetic field at some specific angle. And we also apply the magnetic field along the spin channel uh, just to extract directly the, the spin lifetime out of plane. And the technique basically is, so when, the, when we get here the spins and they propagate along the channel, they will experience some, we will see what here, and we will pick up the signal in this uh, ferromagnetic electrode that is nearby this uh, transition metal decalcarbonate. Okay, let me start by showing you what's happened in the pristine graphene. So here you have the two spin signals that we measure when we apply the magnetic field out of plane. So in this case, we, are, we have access to the uh, in-plane spin lifetime because the spins are, are processing in plane. And we also apply the magnetic field along the spin channel in which the spins process out of plane and we have access to the uh, uh, out of plane spin lifetime. And here you see the different, so you see that there is no different between these two configurations. So this tells you that pristine graphene is an isotropic system, so there is no different in lifetimes when the spins are processing in plane or out of plane. But blazingly, what we observe is that when we partially cover the graphene channel with this transition metal decalcomanite, we observe two things. So the first one is when we apply the magnetic field out of plane, we observe that this signal, this spin signal is strongly reduced. And more uh, interestingly is when we apply the magnetic field alone this spin channel, so in, the, in such a way that the spins persist out of plane. So at zero magnetic field, we have a very, very, uh, very small uh, spin signal that is measured in this detector. But as soon as these spins acquire an out of plane component, we see that the magnitude of the spin, sorry, 
a magnitude, the magnitude of the spin signal is start to increase up to a maximum value that will correspond when the spins are pointing uh, out of plane exactly at the position of the transition metal dichagogenite and they can, they can pass easily through this uh, bilayer structure. So basically, in simple words, what is going on is that if spins are, are coming through this bilayer has have uh, out of plane spins, they can propagate easily and they can propagate and they are picked up by this detector. While if they persist in plane or they have some uh, in plane component, they are blocked by this um, bilayer structure. So basically, if you want to, you can think on this like a sort of a spin filter effect. So now this is again the plot as a cosine as a square. So this is this straight line is what you expect for an isotropic system. And these dots are the ones that we measure in our uh, control sample that is pristine graphene. And here, what you can see is that we have a strong deviation from this isotropic case when we uh, bring together um, this transition metal dichalcogenide with graphene, okay? so. Now the question is, what are the mechanisms that uh, produce this uh, this spin relaxation in graphene? Okay, and this is some this is this was uh, predicted in the group of Stefan Roth, and basically what you, what is happening is in this bilateral structure you have this interval scattering effect. So basically you have the spins that are flipping from one valley to another, and they gives you this uh, this sort of uh, this, this this values of, of, of spin and isotropy. So these are the, the theoretical calculations. So you see that depending on the on the energy uh, of the system, so how 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 far or how close are you from the charge rotating point? So these spin lifetimes can be as large as 100 and can be modulated at values up to 10. So what we experimentally measure is that the spin, uh, uh, the spin life, the spin lifetime anisotropy has a value of around ten, with uh, in-plane spin lifetimes of about three picoseconds and a spin lifetimes out of plane of around uh, thirty picoseconds. And now I want to move to the second part of my talk. So there is another sort of uh, beautiful experiments that you can uh, carry out in these bilayer structures, which are spin to charge conversion. So let me also display, tell you that on top of this out of plane spin texture, so around these cones, we have some winding, we have a winding spin component, okay? And this will cause some effects that I will explain to you now, like the spin galvanic effect. So suppose that we have this sort of, uh, this, so this is, an, this is a, an, a sketch of an ideal device in which you have graphene that is partially covered by this transition metal dichalcogenite. And now we applied a current along this arm, okay? So, and important to say that this current is only flowing in graphene. There is no current flowing in the transition metal dichalcogenide. It's only on the, on the graphene. So you have two effects. So the first one is that due to the enhancement of this spin orbit coupling, so you will have this spin current transversal to, this, to, the, to the current that is uh, due to the spin hole effect with the spins are pointing out of plane in this configuration. But you have also a second effect that is that you create in this interface between the graphene and the transition metal dichalcogenide this non-equilibrium spin density due to the inverse spin galvanic effect. Okay. And now the point is, um, okay, how you can detect these two effects in this sort of lateral structures. So. I will show you the, the I will show you the what we measure, but measuring just the reciprocal effect. So we didn't measure, we, we also measure, but I will show you the effects of the 
very spinhole effect and the spin galvanic effect. Okay, but basically think that, so these spins that can propagate here can be detected by this uh, ferromagnet or vice versa. You can also inject from this ferromagnet some spins and you can detect here on this arm what is the spin signal. And basically how you can discriminate, how you can select to which spins you are sensitive is by playing with the geometry of your magnetic field with respect to, the, to these spins. So if you apply the magnetic field along the, the, along the spin channel, so only the spins arising from the spin hole effect will experience precessions while these spins, this spin density will, uh, will keep unchanged because they, they will not feel this magnetic field and vice versa. So by applying the magnetic field out of plane will be the spins arising uniquely from the spin galvanic effect that will experience this precession. While these, while these spins arising from the spin hole effect, they will not experience uh, any precession. So I want to also remark some of the previous experiments that uh, has been uh, realized in these uh, bilayer heterostructures. Um, uh, particularly relevant also this, 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 this uh, paper by the group of Mambays in which they demonstrate experimentally the rush weilerstein effect by using uh, a monolayer uh, tungsten disulfide uh, Mono, monolayer tungsten disulfide transition metal decalgalganite in contact with graphene. So I will show you our experiments in which we simultaneously detect the, by playing with this geometry, the spin hole effect and the spin galvanic effect, also using uh, tungsten disulfide. Um, so on this sort of experiments, there is something that has, has to, uh, is crucial for these experiments. As I explained to you before, is critical that the current that is flowing in this arm has to flow only on graphene. Otherwise, if you have some current that is flowing through the transition metal like a tokenite, you can have some uh, spin hall effects arising from this uh, GMD, okay? So the first thing that we did in our, uh, in our uh, devices were to characterize this interface, okay? Um, so I'm sorry, so this is a very beautiful uh, sketch of the device, but we also, and this is not illustrated here, we also attach some metallic electrodes to, to this uh, TMD in such a way that we were able to apply a voltage bias across the, this interface between the TMD and graphene and characterize this, this, this barrier. So this is what is plot here as a function as a function of the external bucket, a global bucket that we apply here on a silicon dioxide substrate that this will uh, allow us to control what is the current concentration on the system. So what do you see here is that this interface is insulating up to some threshold voltage, okay? At some, and above this voltage, this interface start to conduct. And what you see here in panel B is how is this, um, how is the, the resistance of the graphene underneath this GMD uh, as a function of the, of the external gate. And what you see here is that, so we have the charge neutrality point around, uh, around minus 10 volts that enables to characterize and to measure this spin hole effect and a spin galvanic effect for both, for electron side and uh, for electron and hole conduction. Because remember that this threshold, uh, this threshold voltage of this interface is here is above, uh, above 10, uh, 10 volts. So let me show you first how we uh, measure the inverse spin hole effect. So in this case, as I explained to you before, we, we do the opposite experiment. So we inject the spins here by sending a, 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 a current as uh, I introduced before. So we have spins that are propagating, are diffusing here along the spin channel, and we apply the magnetic field 
in plane. So this then this this spin will start to precess, and depending on this is the, the the component that they will acquire, acquire, we will detect here some some voltage. So we measure this. So this resistance is the resistance that we measure here that we define at the voltage that we pick up between these two electrodes divided by the current that we apply in this uh, injector. And what you see is that we have this oscillatory behavior that reach a maximum peak corresponding at spins that are exactly pointing out of plane when they reach this uh, bilayer uh, heterostructure region. And then you see that we have this decay and this is basically because we have uh, a spin defacing in the system. So we did exactly the same, but changing the configuration. In this case, we apply the magnetic field um, out of plane in which will be only these spins arising from the spin galvanic effect uh, will experience precession. And in this case, again, we inject the spins here. They will start to precess. And you will see, you see here this oscillatory behavior exactly the same uh, than before, but in this case, this is a signal arising from the spin galvanic effect because the spins that are pointing out uh, uh, are, uh, coming from the spin hole effect, they will not experience any precession. So we also, you can also be sensitive to the, to the spin galvanic effect indeed by using this configuration. But in this case, you will need, you will need a full saturation of this ferromagnet in this direction. So for a, strong, for a strong enough magnetic fields in which you saturate the magnetization of the injector along this spin channel, you can also detect this, this, uh, this spin galvanic effect. And this is what we demonstrate here as a function of the gate voltage. So depending if you have hole or electron conduction, you see that the change of the, you have a uh, change in sign for the spin galvanic effect and close to the charge neutrality point. Remember that charge neutrality point was at minus 10 volt. You basically vanish. So the spin galvanic effect basically vanishes away and you have only the spin hole effect component. So these are the measurements of the spin hole effect and the spin galvanic effect as a function of the external gating. And what you see here is that you have a change close to the charge neutrality point from the spin galvanic effect from negative to positive. And this is uh, coming due to the nature of the carriers that you have in the system. And you have also uh, a peak close to the charge neutrality point for the spin hole effect. So indeed we did temperature measurement pro uh, um, temperature dependent measurements. And we observed that we have also this peak and dip for the spin hole effect. You see here, so we couldn't uh, observe this peak and dip at uh, room temperature uh, very likely because we have electron, uh, electron hole paddles in the system and some uh, uh, temperature broadening of, in the measurement. But you see here that when we start to cool down the system, we are also able to distinguish and to, 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 to start to, to see this peak and dip. And this also was very well uh, reproduced by theory in the Stefan Roche group, in which they calculate the spin hole conductivity in the low uh, uh, disorder limit. And we can also reproduce very well. So there is a very good match between experiments and theory. And I think that I am mostly running so I am fine, Stefan, with the time or? To if you can conclude and then we can have some questions. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So this is the main message. And so I am open to questions. And of course, if you want more information, you can find in these two references that are uh, the recent work that we have been carried out here in, in Barcelona. Thank you very much for, for your attention. And uh, I'm glad to, glad to answer your, your questions.